He had seen the stir in the encampment behind them. The enemy would notice it soon, and the church bells would ring the alarm, and the town walls would fill with defenders armed with crossbows. The crossbows would rip their bolts into the attackers, and Skeet's job today was to try to clear those crossbowmen off the wall with his arrows. Some chance, he thought sourly, the defenders would crouch behind their crenellations and so deny his men an opportunity to aim, and doubtless this assault would end as the five other attacks had finished in failure. It had been a whole campaign of failure. William Boone, the Earl of Northampton, who led this small English army, had launched the winter expedition in hope of capturing a stronghold in northern Brittany. But the assault on Carix had been a humiliating failure. The defenders of Gangon had laughed at the English, and the walls of Lannion had repulsed every attack. They had captured Tréguier, but as that town had no walls, it was not much of an achievement and no place to make a fortress. Now, at the bitter end of the year, with nothing better to do, the Earl's army had fetched up outside this small town, which was scarcely more than a walled village. But even this miserable place had defied the army. The Earl had launched attack after attack, and all had been beaten back. The English had been met by a storm of crossbow bolts, the scaling ladders had been thrust from the ramparts, and the defenders had exulted in each failure. What is this goddamn place called? Skeet asked. La Roche Derrien, a tall archer answered. You would know, Tom, Skeet said. You know everything. That is true, Will, Thomas said gravely. Quite literally true. The other archers laughed. So if you know so bloody much, Skeet said, tell me what this goddamn town is called again. La Roche Derrien. Duff bloody name, Skeet said. He was grey-haired, thin-faced, and had known nearly 30 years of fighting. He came from Yorkshire and had begun his career as an archer fighting against the Scots. He had been as lucky as he was skilled, and so he had taken plunder, survived battles and risen in the ranks until he was wealthy enough to raise his own band of soldiers. He now led 70 men-at-arms and as many archers whom he had contracted to the Earl of Northampton's service, which was why he was crouching behind a wet hedge 150 paces from the walls of a town whose name he still could not remember. His men-at-arms were in the camp, given a day's rest after leading the last failed assault. Will Skeet hated failure. La Roche what? He asked Thomas. Derriere. What does that goddamn mean? That, I confess, I do not know. Sweet Christ! Skeet opened his mouth to say something, but just then the first of La Roche Derriere's church bells sounded the alarm. It was the crack bell, the one that sounded so harsh, and within seconds the other churches added their tolling, so that the wet wind was filled with their clangor. The noise was greeted by a subdued English cheer as the assault troops came from the camp and pounded up the road towards the town's southern gate. The leading men carried ladders, the rest had swords and axes. The Earl of Northampton led the assault, as he had led all the others, conspicuous in his plate armour, half covered by a surcoat, showing his badge of the lions and stars. You know what to do, Skeet bellowed. The archers stood, drew their bows and loosed. There were no targets on the walls, for the defenders were staying low, but the rattle of the steel-tipped arrows on the stones should keep them crouching. The white-feathered arrows hissed as they flew. Two other archer bands were adding their own shafts, many of them firing high into the sky so that their missiles dropped vertically onto the wall's top, and to Skeet it seemed impossible that anyone could live under that hail of feather-tipped steel. Yet as soon as the Earl's attacking column came within a hundred paces, the crossbow bolts began to spit from the walls. There was a breach close to the gate. It had been made by a catapult, the only siege machine left in decent repair, and it was a poor breach for only the top third of the wall had been dismantled by the big stones, and the townsfolk had crammed timber and bundles of cloth into the gap. But it was still a weakness in the wall, and the ladder men ran towards it, shouting as the crossbow bolts whipped into them. Men stumbled, fell, crawled and died, but enough lived to throw two ladders against the breach, and the first men-at-arms began to climb. The archers were loosing as fast as they could, overwhelming the top of the breach with arrows, but then a shield appeared there, a shield that was immediately stuck by a score of shafts, and from behind the shield a crossbow man shot straight down one of the ladders, killing the leading man. Another shield appeared, another crossbow was loosed. 
A pot was shoved onto the breech's top, then toppled over, and a gush of steaming liquid spilled down to make a man scream in agony. Defenders were hurling boulders over the breach, and their crossbows were snapping. Closer! Skeet shouted, and his archers pushed through the hedge and ran to within a hundred paces of the town ditch, where they again loosed their long war bows and slashed their arrows into the embrasures. Some defenders were dying now, for they had to show themselves to shoot their crossbows down into the crowd of men who jostled at the foot of the four ladders that had been laid against the breach or walls. Men-at-arms climbed, a forked pole shoved one ladder back, and Thomas twitched his left hand to change his aim and released his fingers to drive an arrow into the breast of a man pushing on the pole. The man had been covered by a shield held by a companion, but the shield shifted for an instant and Thomas's arrow was the first through the small gap, though two more followed before the dying man.